All right, so hey everyone, uh, welcome to this session. Thank you very much for joining in. Uh, so this session is all about Delta live tables, uh, building reliable ETL pipelines with Azure Data Prex. Uh, so this time I'm joining virtually, but hopefully next year, you know, I'll be able to join in person as well, just like you know most of you are. So let's get started and let me just quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mohit Batra. I'm founder at Crystal Talks, and we are mostly into content development, training, and consultancy. Uh, I work as a plural site author as well, so I do publish a lot of video content uh, on topics like Snowflake, Databricks, Delta Lake, and so on. Uh, plus, I have previously I've worked with companies like Microsoft and Saxo Bank. Uh, my LinkedIn profile is there on your screen in case you wish to have a look, uh, or in case you wish to connect, I'll be more than happy to connect with you. All right, so let's get started and see what we are going to do today. Uh, we are going to focus on, uh, you know, first of all, what are the challenges we get with uh, with the with the ETL pipelines, and then we'll focus on what are Delta Live tables and how it can actually help us build reliable ETL pipelines. All right, so let's get started and see. First of all, you know, we're going to talk about uh, architecture, which is very, very common when we start working with, you know, with, with data lakes. Now, what is this Delta architecture? Number one, basically it focuses on improving the quality of data. So this means that whatever data that we are, you know, that we are capturing, that we are ingesting, uh, we are, uh, you know, modifying, or basically we are transforming that, you know, the Delta architecture focuses on improving the quality of data. And we'll see how. Number two, it, it you know, the same Delta architecture can actually uh, focus or in fact, it can serve multiple personas. Uh, basically, it can serve for, you know, it can work for data engineers. So data engineers can pick up the data from there. They can go ahead and process that. Number two, it can also help machine learning engineers and data scientists to take the data, which is cleaned up, obviously, which is granular. So they can just go ahead and pick up that data and, you know, start uh, building their machine learning models and work with it. Number three, the same architecture is also, you know, also focuses on the business users so that they can extract the data. So we have seen that there have been a lot of sessions on Power BI. So, you know, in Power BI as well, you should be able to get the data from this Delta architecture that we are going to set up. All right. Number three is this particular architecture is also is also referred as medallion architecture. So some of you might see references to medallion architecture or sometimes it is called as Delta architecture as well. So we'll try to understand what is there in this architecture and how we can build it using Delta Live tables. All right, moving ahead, let's look at you know the, what do we have in this architecture. Number one, this particular architecture contains multiple layers. So what is the first layer? The first layer is basically referred as a bronze layer. Now you may want, want to go ahead and refer them with any other names like raw layer or you know the ingestion layer, whatever name you want to use, you can go and use that. But in uh, let's say medallion architecture or Delta architecture, this is referred as a bronze layer. Now, what do we have in this bronze layer? In the bronze layer, we basically get all the raw data. Now, this means that if you are ingesting data from different sources like uh, Salesforce, Snowflake, you're getting the data from, uh, let's say, you know, from Dynamics, ServiceNow, from wherever you're getting the data in whatever format, you can go and put this in the bronze layer. So this is going to be our one single source, or basically this is going to be our single source of truth, having all kinds of data that we are going to land here. So you can have your ETL pipelines, which are, or basically the copy pipelines, which are getting you all the data into the bronze layer. Now, this is very useful for data engineers as well. So which means that, Whatever you know, you can get the data from different locations, and whenever you know data engineers want to reprocess the data, they can simply go and pick it up from this bronze layer. All right, so this is you know one of the layers where we can have all kinds of historical data, which you know which can land here. Number two, once we have the bronze layer, obviously we would like to take this raw data and we would like to you know kind of process that. This is where we have the silver layer. So you know we can take the data from the bronze layer, use our compute engines. Uh, you know, process the or basically clean and transform the data and then put it into the silver layer. So the silver layer is going to focus on all kinds of granular data, which means, you know, if you're getting customer data from multiple different sources, you know, we kind of standardize them, have it in a granular format and then put it into the silver layer. So this is where we combine the data from, let's say, as I mentioned, if you have customer data, you can go and take the data from different locations, combine them and put it into the silver layer by removing duplicates, by, uh, you know, removing null values and all other kinds of, you know, data quality issues, we can, you know, kind of uh, clean it up and then put it into the silver layer. 
Now, once we have the silver layer, compare this with the enterprise data warehouse layer where you can put all the data. Number three, then then we have the gold layer. Now this is these la this particular layer is focused on the domain specific data. For example, you might have data for marketing domain, uh, for sales domain, for uh, let's say uh, you know other departments. So you can go and have domain specific uh, data present into the gold layer. Now, if you if we put this into perspective, think of this like if you take up a data lake or a storage space. So one folder can be your bronze layer. Just as an example, second layer, second folder could be your silver layer and third folder could be your gold layer. And of course, in the gold layer, you can have different different folders to keep domain specific data. So gold layer is basically used for the BI or reporting purposes. So this is where business users can pitch in. They can pick up the data. Uh, the silver layer can be used by data. Uh, let's say the data scientists or machine learning engineers where they can get the cleaned up data, but in granular format. And then of course, the raw data can be used by data engineers to you know, if they want to reprocess this data, they can get it from here. Now, this is what we have in the Delta architecture. Now, think about that for this architecture, if we have to go and build an ETL pipeline, what is it that we are going to do? So very easy. We are going to ingest the data into the bronze layer from the bronze layer, put it into silver layer, and then we put it into the gold layer. So very, very straightforward, very simple to build, right? Actually, no. So everybody knows that this is, you know, this is just a representation, but the ETL pipelines are not that simple to build. So what kind of, you know, problems that we face here? First of all, we are not working with a single entity. We are actually working with multiple entities. So, you know, you might have hundreds of entities like customers, sales, orders, whatever what else, you know, you can have lots and lots of entities, you know, which uh, for which you're going to process. So this is where you're going to have you know, lots of data into your bronze layer, or in fact, a lot of entities into the bronze layer. Now, it never happens to be a one-to-one -one mapping. It always has a, you know, kind of a multiple or one-to-many mappings. So this means you might be extracting data from customer and accounts, and you might want to combine them into the silver layer. So this means there is a lot of complexity involved. There are a lot of dependencies involved between multiple layers that you would like to address. All right. Then, of course, you know, once the data goes into the gold layer, if you want to combine them, if you want to aggregate them. So it's not about always aggregation is again. Aggregation is not just one to one. There will be multiple entities that will have to combine them and then put it into the gold layer. Think about if you're getting, let's say, customer data and you're getting accounts data. And if you're looking for sales department, you know, they might want to kind of combine them and show it as a one single view or you might want to put up put up reports there. So this means that ETL building up ETL pipelines is, a, is an extremely tough job. If you are into ETL development, you know, I'm sure you know it very well. It's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty difficult task to do. That is why, you know, so let's talk about what kind of other complexities we might face with the ETL pipelines or we do face with the ETL pipelines. Number one is the infrastructure. So, so far we have been talking about the architecture. We have been talking about the dependencies, but if you have lots and lots of data to process, the infrastructure is an extremely big challenge. You know, how do you scale this infrastructure? How do you make sure that, you know, we have the, we are not spending too much or we are not spending, uh, you know, we are not spending above limits. And we also have to make sure that we are, you know, we are not under, or in fact, we, you know, we are having the right amount of resources. Number two is about managing the dependencies, as you saw in the previous slide, that we also need to make sure that if we are combining, let's say, customer and accounts data, you know, which entity should be processed first and which entity should be processed next. In the same way, we also want to, you know, track the lineage, you know, from where the data is flowing, whether it's coming from Dynamics, it's coming from Salesforce. So, you know, from where the data is actually coming and then it is going to the end users. Number four is we not just have the batch data, or the historical data, we also have the streaming data that we need to take care of. So again, this is a very big challenge when you have, you know, when you have to build separate streaming and batch pipelines, it becomes difficult to manage. There are lots of chances of errors that can come in. So we also need to ensure that we have the batch pipelines and the streaming pipelines handled in a seamless and you know, in a seamless way. Number five, we have the we also have to ensure that the data quality is, of course, you know, this is the most important point that whatever data we are storing in any of these layers, you know, there is there it has gone through a proper data quality check. Uh, number five, you know, there are they can be failures. They can be retries. If you are an ETL engineer, you know it very well that there can be lots of failures, you know, when you are building the pipelines and you might have to retry. And if you are retrying, you also have to ensure there is no data duplication and so on and so forth.
and then of course you have to monitor them you have to and if you know so you have to sit down nights you have to monitor your pipelines and you have to make sure they are optimized and you can complete them you know much ahead of time or you know or your sls and finally you have to deploy your pipelines into multiple environments you know from development to pre-production to production so this is again another challenge that we have to take care of so you know so there are lots and lots of challenges associated to uh, with building ETL pipelines, and that's what we'll see how this can be addressed using Delta Live Tables. So Delta Live Tables, basically, you know, it's a simply a framework uh, which using which you can build uh, the pipelines, and you can we can address all the challenges that you have seen on the previous slide. So you know, this is all looks a bit theoretical, building reliable, automated, declarative. But the point is that we would like to make sure that whatever challenges that we have seen, you know, we are able to address that using the DLT pipelines. All right, number two, this is built by Databricks. So this is only available in Databricks right now. It's not open source, so we have to, you know, so if you want to work with it, you have to work with the Databricks environment. Now let me show you what kind of pipelines we can build with DLT. So this is just a sample pipeline that we are going to build in in a few minutes, you know, or in this session. So you'll see that how we can build, uh, you know, kind of have dependencies in between the pipelines. So you can see this way. So we'll also see that how we can handle streaming data as well as the batch data in a single pipeline. So you'll see how we are handling the batch data, how we are handling the streaming data, how we are doing incremental loading, and how we are handling dependencies, you know, in this single, you know, in this single demo. All right, so moving ahead, let's talk about, you know, before we get into the demos, let's talk about what are the components of DLT. Number one, we have got something called as live data sets. Now, what exactly are live data sets? Whatever tables that are involved in our DLT pipeline. So, for example, if you have, you know, the, uh, the let's say the tables in your bronze layer, if you have tables in your uh, silver layer and if you have tables in the gold layer, basically those are called as live data sets. So, you know, just remember the keyword, it's called live data sets because they are being managed by the Delta live tables. Number two, you know, the, it, uh, the second component we have is the data quality checks. That means that when the data is moving between different layers, we would like to apply some data quality checks automatically without any manual intervention. Of course, you have to write down your code and then it will take care of all the data quality checks, you know, which is moving between different layers. Number three is the transformation queries like when you have the data in your raw layer and you want to move it to the let's say the silver or the gold layer, what kind of query that you would like to run basically to aggregate the data or you know, to uh, let's say combine the data. So what kind of queries would you like to run? That is basically the transformation queries. And remember that this is also going to take care of all the dependencies between the queries. And I'll show you an example, so you know how you can handle these kind of dependencies. Moving ahead and finally we have the pipelines. So very simple, four, six, four components only. In the pipelines, we'll see that how we can handle the infrastructure. Number two, how it can handle the lineage, process the data, and handle the execution, logs, and all kinds of errors. So very simple, four components only that we are going to look into and see how we can build end-to-end -end pipelines. Now, let me show you that what is the first pipeline that we're going to build here. So very simple, we'll keep a simple one first, and then we'll look into a complex one. So we are going to have one single entity into bronze layer, one single into silver layer so which means we'll have the raw data landing here we'll go and clean up and put it into the silver layer and then of course we'll build two summarize tables into the cold layer so this is what we're going to do understand all the components and then we'll go and build a complex pipeline so let's move ahead and talk about you know let's look into that demo here all right so I'm basically I'm right now inside the Databricks workspace and I hope everybody is able to see that so what I have here is I have got one notebook here called yellow taxis all right and let me just give me a second i'll just go and start my cluster as well so we can just go and have a look at you know run some code as well all right uh, so let me just go back to my notebook here so what we have is i'm going to go ahead and create a bronze table now this is like a very standard table there is nothing fancy here if you have worked with spark you know, so what we are doing, we are creating basically a Spark table. And what we are saying, all right, let's go and create a table called yellow taxis underscore bronze. Now, only thing that you have to note here is that we are putting a keyword called live so that Databricks knows that we are working with the Delta live tables environment. 
All right, this is the only change that we have. Otherwise, this is like a regular table, but putting up a live keyword means that we know that this is going to be handled by Delta live tables. All right, and then we are going ahead and defining some columns. So we are going to work with some uh, taxi New York City taxi data, and we can see that we have just put up some columns, their data types and everything, you know, and then we are saying that this data is going to be partitioned by a particular column so that, you know, we don't put all the data in, you know, one set of files. We are going to split the data into multiple folders and, you know, that's going to be by vendor. Again, you know, that depends on your requirement. How would you like to whether you want to partition the data or not? Then what we are saying is that in this particular table, we would like to how would we like to put the data? We would like to run this particular query. Take the data from this particular location. Now this is a basically a mapped location or a mounted location. So we would like to take the data from this particular location and basically you know it's in parquet format and then this is so I'm going to say select star and I'm going to say all right plus some additional columns like what is the file from which the data is coming? And second, what is the timestamp at which we are inserting the data? Now, what is the purpose of this? This means that because we are going to put the data into the raw layer, so I would like to also know from which file the data is coming, you know, and we, we also want to know that what is the timestamp at which the data was inserted. So this is the way in which we can go ahead and define a Delta Live table. All right, so this is like a regular table, but it's going to be managed by DLT. Now, once we define the live, you know, the bronze table. Now, second step, we are going to define a silver table. So, as you know, that silver table is all about, you know, the cleaned up data. So, I don't need all these columns. So, let me show this to you. So, we have got lots of columns here. So, I'm okay to put that in the raw layer, but I don't want all the columns in my silver layer. So, I'm going to reduce the number of columns here. So, notice this one. I'm creating another live table, reducing the number of columns which are required. Plus, I'm also going ahead and just like we do it in the databases, we are also going to have some calculated columns being created here. So what we are saying that whatever pickup time is there for the taxi ride, we are going to take this pickup time and we are going to calculate the year, month and day. So basically just an example, we are creating some calculated columns here for our spark table. Now, once we define this one, you know, once we define our table structure, now comes the interesting aspect here. Now in DLT, we can also go and define the constraints right on the table. And it's not just the constraints of the table. We are also would like to see, you know, some statistics once we run the pipelines. So what we are saying is that one constraint is that total amount, you know, should not be or basically it should not be null and it should be greater than zero. That's our requirement. So this is what we expect here. In case the data or the total amount is null, or it is less than or equal to zero, we are going to simply drop the record. So this is just one example that, you know, if the total amount is not correct, we would like to drop the record. In the same way, if the trip distance is equal to zero or less than zero, we would like to again drop the row. But then we have got ride ID, which is basically our unique key. In case the ride ID is not, you know, is basically null or it's less than zero, we would like to fail this process. So of course we would like to capture the information as well, but we would like to fail the whole process saying that, no, we don't want to proceed. You know, we don't want to run this transaction because now we have got some information or the unique column, which is not coming correctly. So we have just went ahead, defined the columns. We have also went ahead and defined the constraints on the table. Now we would like to mention that how we are going to fill up this table. This is where we are going to write another query and notice that we are picking up the data from the bronze live table. Okay, so you're going to take the data from bronze live table and then this is the query we are going to run. Of course, you can run your, you know, you can write some, uh, you know, some other functions. You want to clean up some data. You want to make some changes. You can go and done, do everything inside your SQL query. Can we do this in Python? Can we do this in Scala? Yes, we can do that as well. So you don't, you're not restricted to SQL. You can do it in, you know, in whatever language you want. Now, only thing that we have to note here is that in case we are getting the data from a live table, we just have to say live dot. That's it. This is the only thing, you know, specifically that we are doing here. So once we define our silver table, what we have done, define the columns, define some generated columns as well. In fact, there is support for slowly changing dimensions. There are, you know, there are other supports as well, which we can add into the DLT pipelines. Then we have defined the constraints. We have defined this is the you know this is the query which is going to fill up the table and you know so we have we are just going to take the data from the live table now once we define this number 3 we are going to create some goal tables now this is going to be another simple way 
or simple tables. So we are going to create another live table called gold and we are going to put up some group by statement. You know, this is kind of report that we are building. So think about that starting from the raw layer up to the gold layer. We are simply saying, OK, these are the queries which are going to take up the data in each layer and move it, move it forward. And again, if you notice this one that since we want to get the data from silver live table, we are just going to refer it using the live keyword. That's it. This is the only thing you know we are defining here. Now once we define this again, there is another table that we are creating. So you can see if I show you the diagram again, this is what we are doing. One bronze table, one silver table and two gold tables. Now, so once we define this piece of code, now let's start to run it with the DLT pipelines. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and let me just go into the workflows. And I'm going to say, all right, let me create a DLT or a Delta live table pipeline and let me show you how this looks like. So it will take a bit of time to run, but so I'll just show you how to create it and then I'll show you how it looks like when it runs. So I'm going to say let's create a pipeline. Let's call it, you know, SQL bits. Uh, pipeline two. All right, and then I'm going to say this is going to be this is going to run when it's going to be triggered. So we don't want to run it. We can of course we can run it continuously, which means you know every uh, it basically it's going to run continuously, but we can say whenever we want, let's say every day at 9 p.m. You know we want to run it. So this is it's going to run. Then we are going to put up the notebooks with where we have the code. So I'm going to say my code is available in this particular notebook yellow taxis. Let's select this one. All right, and then I can also go ahead and define the table where I would like to put my table. You know, I would like to put my table. So this is the database name. Uh, I can say SQL bits TB2. So this is the name of the database that I'm defining, and then I can say what is the infrastructure that I want here. So I can say, uh, you know, I can define the minimum and maximum number of workers. So Databricks has got you know and very optimized auto scaling feature so if you have very less data it's going to work with one single worker but if you have got lots of data you know you can have it can take up the multiple workers automatically now i'm going to use basically a fixed size here and say all right i just need one worker to you know to process this data that's it this is all we need to define so we have taken care of infra we have taken care of constraints we have taken care of moving the data between different layers all right, so let me just go ahead and create this pipeline. So basically what it will do, it will. Yeah, so pipeline is ready. I'm just going to start that quickly. Now this will take around five minutes to set up the infrastructure in the on the you know at the first time, but after that it's going to you know work. It's going to work much faster. Now let me while this is running, let me show you how it looks like when it actually runs. All right, so I'll just go and show you an existing pipeline I have. Right, so there we go. So this is how it looks like. So it will show you that now notice here it has automatically figured out the dependencies between different components. So remember we had the so you know we had the bronze layer. It says it's a materialized view. This means the data has been stored into the into the data lake. Then from here the data is going to move on to the silver layer. Now notice if you remember that silver layer has got the constraints. So when we run the bronze you know when we run the bronze table it actually picked up this many number of records okay so no records were dropped here because this is our you know raw layer but when the data moved from bronze layer to silver layer if, if you remember we had the constraints created so notice here that 0.8 percent rows have been dropped here okay and what is the reason for dropping those rows some of the records does not have the valid trip distance because it is less it's equal to zero and some of the records does not have a valid total amount basically it's you know it's equal to zero or, or it is null so it has automatically used these constraints to figure out that what was the issue and it has you know captured some statistics for us as well now if you want to capture and put this information into a separate place let's say you know you want to capture the records where trip distance is less than zero or you know we can do that as well OK, so this is how our first pipeline looks like. So you can see that number of records have reduced when it was taken from the bronze layer. And then, you know, we are having some summary tables where we have 35 and, you know, 22,000 records. So all this, you know, the aggregation has been performed. Now, if we go in now, this is what a simple pipeline looks like. But if we go and look at, you know, let's look at some complex one. All right, now how this complex pipeline will look like. Now I would like to also introduce some streaming data here. So this means that now first 
I'm going to mix and match some batch data and the streaming data. So for example, we are going to have a taxi zones. This is going to be something called as a complete table. Now what is what do we mean by complete table? This means this is going to reload every time. So batch data means it's going to or complete table means it's going to be reloaded every time. Then from taxi zones, we are going to take the data and create a view on top of it again. So you can have materialized you know, structure where you are storing the data physically, but we can also create views on top of it. So I'm going to create a view, define some more, you know, complex queries so that I can pick it up from the bronze layer. So bronze layer will have a table, but you know, we are going to have simply a view in the silver layer because you know, it's a very small table. Then on the other side, I'm going to take the, you know, take the yellow taxis data, but this time I'm going to make it a streaming table, which means that you know whenever we are reading the data we are only going to read the change data you know let's say if i if i'm reading the data from let's say from data lake i'm going to only pick up the files which are new and i'm not going to pick up the files which are you know which have already been processed okay so this is means we are going to take work with the streaming data here then from this one i'm going to create another view on top of it so that i can apply some constraints i can go and you know make some changes to my query which is going to go out from the bronze layer then I'm going to create another table in the silver layer. And this time, whatever new changes are coming here, I'm going to merge it. For example, let's say on a daily basis, you're getting some customer data. So whatever raw data you're getting on a daily basis, you're going to store it in the raw layer, but then that customer might already be existing. So we would like to go and merge the information into the silver layer. So this is what we are going to perform. Take the data you know, and see that whether we, it needs to be updated, it needs to be deleted or it needs to be inserted. So we are going to perform an insert update delete operation at this particular point. And once we have the, you know, the incremental data being loaded here, then we are going to go ahead and again create some summary tables. This is going to be complete table. This means the summary tables are going to be reloaded on a daily basis. Again, depends on your requirement whether you would like to incrementally load these summary tables or you would like to go and, you know, recreate them. So this is the kind of pipeline now we are going to build. So we'll have on one side, we'll have basically the complete loading of data that's called complete table. And on another side, we are going to do incremental loading of data, you know, by taking it from data lake. Okay, so let's go and see that how it looks like. If I guess some couple of people are taking the picture. So if you have done that, so I'll just move ahead. And yep, I think some of you are doing it. So wonderful. So let's move on and see that how this pipeline looks like. So I'm going to go in and uh, once again, I'll just go and show you a couple of another notebooks. So first of all, let me show you taxi zones notebook. How does it look like? So this is going to be very similar to what you have seen already in the previous example. So I'm going to create basically a live table. So this is going to be for taxi zones. And if you notice here that we are reading the data from Parquet files, uh, if I'm sure you know many of you must be knowing parquet already contains a schema, so I don't need to define the schema for the table. I'm going to simply take the files from there, take the schema, and this is going to be the schema of you know that we are going to put in the raw layer. So all the raw data we are going to put as it is into our bronze table here. Now, once we define the bronze table, then we are going to create a silver view. Remember that we are not going to materialize the data. We are simply going to create a view on top of it because you know if you are moving the data between different layers. We don't have to materialize in every in every layer because if it's a small table, we can simply create a view on top of it. So what we are doing, we are creating a view here and on the view as well. We are going and putting a constraint saying that, you know, if the uh, if the if this is not the if this condition does not meet, we are going to drop the row here. So this is how we are very simply creating a silver layer. Now just notice once again that we are using the live keyword, which means we are going to take the data from the bronze one. Now this is how we are you know doing a complete loading of the data. See this one once again. So we are going to take the data from here, you know, which is from the source, put it into the bronze and create a view on top of it in the silver layer. Okay, so this part is done. Now let's see the incremental part here. So I'm going to show you another notebook. How does that look like? Now this is where if you remember previously we were using the keyword or we were using the command create live table. Now this time because we want to have streaming data, we are going to say create streaming live table. This means we are only going to pick incremental data, you know, from from the from the source location. So once we define the create streaming live table and this is the name we are keeping, 
again, we can define the query from which, where we would like to pick up the data. So you can see now things are becoming a bit more complex. So we can just define column names. We can define their data types. We can even more, of course, in raw, we don't modify the data, but if you want to, you can do that as well. So once so again, we are going to take the file from where the data is coming. What is the timestamp at which the data is coming in? That's a typical thing that we do in ETL pipelines. And now we are saying using this particular feature of Databricks, I'm not going to go into details of this. This is called auto loader. So auto loader is a functionality in Databricks that can incrementally pick up the files. Now this also means that the you know this particular table is only going to get new files which are coming in, and we are going to load the data into this table. OK, and this is going to be a CSV format. We are going to infer the schema for you know for the CSV files. Of course, if you want, you can go and define your own schema and then you can use it. Now, once we define the streaming table, which means if there is one file right now, it will pick up the first file. But if new file comes, it will only pick up the new file, not the exit, you know, not the one which has been processed already. Now, moving ahead, we are going to create another view on top of it. This is going to be streaming view, which means whenever you query this view, it's going to use the change data capture functionality of of you know of these tables and only show you the new changes which have come in which means that you know if there is a new file that comes in and you query this view it will only show you the new records and not the old one okay and then we are again going ahead and creating some constraints on top of it you know which we have already seen and now we are saying all right let me pick up the data you know and this is kind of some additional kind of modifications we are doing. Now just notice if you want to pick up the data from a batch table, you know, this is the way to do that. Let's say which means that if you want to take the whole data, you simply use this particular option. But if you want to pick up the streaming data, which means only the changes, then you use the stream keyword as well. Now you don't have to we don't have to mug up the syntax right now, but I hope you're getting the idea that you know it's all about whether you want to take the whole data or do you want to take only the incremental data from your source table. Now once we define the view again, we can define a silver table. This is going to be a streaming live table once again, which means only the new changes should be loaded into this table. Now here is the final command which is going to you know merge the changes from the bronze to the silver again this is like you know slightly complex syntax but you know it's all about getting used to it it will take you know take you a day or so to get used to it and then of course you can start writing your own code now we are going to use this apply changes command and simply say all right let's you know so we can go and merge the changes which means we can do inserts updates and deletes into the silver table by using this particular command. Of course, there is a lot more you can do. You can apply delete. You can do inserts updates with this one single command. All right, so once we define this kind of changes that how do we want to merge or merge the data, then we can go ahead and again create the complete tables. Notice I'm not using the streaming keyword anymore, which means that these tables will be reloaded every time. All right, so that's how we are defining two more tables here, you know, which is going to be completely loaded every time. Now, once we have done this part or once we have written this code, once again, we can go back to the workflows. All right, let's see if you know if our previous pipeline has run, which we did right away. Yeah, there you can see that this is what I did, you know, a few minutes back and the pipeline has loaded here. Now, let me show you or we can change it this pipeline itself. Let me just go to the settings. And instead of using one notebook, now think about you are modularizing your notebooks as well. So instead of having one notebook, I can just say, all right, I would like to have two notebooks, one for taxi zones. All right, and one for the yellow taxis incremental. I'm going to select this one. So think about if you have got 100 entities to work with, you don't have to put everything into single notebook. You can just go and create 100 different notebooks. They will be modular. You can do some testing for them. If everything is looking good, then you know you can go and select in the source code where your data is, you know, code is present. Once you define this, and again, you can define how much compute you need. Let's save this one. And this is going to pick up the data from our source folder. So let me just do this one. Let me start it now that our infra is already running. So you'll see how it looks like. Let me just go and hit start here. Yep, there we go. So it's creating an update, which means it's looking at, you know, what is the changes which are there in your code? You know, it's already has the resources because cluster is already running. Uh, we, we are in the dev environment, so cluster is, you know, automatically running. But if you move it to production environment, so whenever you run your job, 
you know only then your cluster will start it will complete your pipeline and you know and you know it will drop the cluster so that's you know that's the if you want to move the pipelines between different environments now notice here it is setting up the tables for us which means because we have now taxi zones table we have some incremental tables so it is going ahead and setting up these tables and then once it has set up the table it will show us the lineage of where the data is coming where it needs to go okay it will hardly take few more seconds we can actually check that in the log as well so this is how the Right now it's setting up the tables and once this is done, it should be able to show us the graph in a few seconds. But right, if it you know it will take more time, I'll show you an existing pipeline which is already there. OK, so you know, let it go and meanwhile I'll show you how the pipeline looks like. So I'll just go to an existing pipeline which I have already run. And this is how it looks like. So what you can see that by just writing those two separate notebooks. So in, if you remember in taxi zones, we had a bronze table, which is a materialized table, which means we are storing the data actually on disk. And number two, we have a view created on top of it. This was in one single notebook. Now in the second notebook, what we did, we created a streaming table and that's what you can notice here. It's a streaming table, so it's going to incrementally pick up the data. Right now it's picking up all the records which are there in one single file and then of course it creates a view and if you look at the view it should show you that how many records have dropped nothing so everything is looking pretty good and then we go on to the silver table and let's see yeah everything is fine here so we have incrementally loaded the data and then we have got the materialized views so what i would you know what i wanted to show you here is that by just having two separate notebooks it's able to figure out what are the dependencies so you can see that dependencies have been identified even if they are in different notebooks so that's how you know you can kind of have separate notebooks for raw layer you know separate notebooks for silver layer and for bronze for gold layer as well and then in the gold layer you can have you know joints and everything between different tables now this is all about loading the data in you know for the first time but when we load this for the second time now notice here that right now it's pointing it's 10 million records it's 1 crore and now if we go into the second run and let's say if you upload more data you can see that the new one has only picked up ah, just a second there we go. So you can see that the new file that I uploaded only had four records. So it only picked up those four records and incrementally merged it into the silver silver label, you know, into the silver table. So this could mean this would mean that there might be inserts, updates, or deletes that have been performed. But then this one have been loaded completely. Okay. So again, you know, 35 and 250 rows have been loaded, you know, into our materialized views. So this is how we can work with the Delta live tables without worrying about the infra, without worrying about the data quality. Of course, you have to worry about, you know, and write down your code for data quality checks and all. But once you define it, your, you know, the dependencies, lineage can automatically be taken care of. The another good thing is that if you are working with, let's say, Microsoft Purview, you know, this kind of lineage can also be captured there. And then, you know, you can use it to identify from where the data has flown, you know, to your end users. So that's it. This is all we have in, you know, in this session. Of course, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to put that in the chat window and, you know, we can go and take it up from there. So once again, you know, just before we go and, you know, pick up any questions. So this is the feedback link in front of your screen. Uh, we'll be very glad if you can just go ahead and, you know, fill up some feedback. Thank you. And let's see, you know, if you can, if you want, you can put up your questions in the Q&A panel or if, uh, you know, if, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to go and ask that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Good, good. Yeah, we've got some questions. It's not coming up on your Canopy app for some reason, so I'm just going to read them out if that's okay. Sure, sure. That okay, would be wonderful. So we've got Anders asks, can you send failed rows to another table for later inspection? Yes. So this is something which I, uh, you know, which I quickly mentioned, but probably, you know, we, I, I mentioned it too quickly. So basically, if there are any failed rows, that can also be moved to a separate location. Now, what you can also do is that, uh, you know, so that's one of the options. The second option is you can create another table. You know, let me just show that to you. So what we can do, we can also go and create a table. Let's see if I can do that. 
Yeah. So you know, so in this particular table, we are saying the constraint is that total amount is not null and it should be greater than zero. So one of the options is that instead of dropping the row, you can move it to another one. But that is something which is coming up right now. That's in private preview, but very soon that will be available. Or right now, if you want to do it, so what you can say, let me create another table, and that table you can put up a constraint saying total amount is null or it's equal to equal to you know equal to or less than zero. If you put a constraint like this, then you know the uh, you know so basically we are kind of creating a conditional split between two tables. Move the right data into you know into your main table and then have a error table where you can move the data. Hope that answers, answers the question. Okay. Yeah. So Jan asks, how do you handle dependencies between separate notebooks? All right, so this is something which is a feature of DLT framework. And actually, if you look at what we have done right now, so we actually created two notebooks. So we had a taxi zones notebook. And let me just show you. Uh, let's say if I go to the incremental notebook, and let me, I think this is something which I did not show you. So notice this one. We are creating a goal table. And in this goal table, I'm simply saying, you know, join the silver, uh, yellow taxi silver table and join it with the taxi zone silver live. Now remember that taxis, this particular table has been created in a separate notebook. And this is, you know, so this is not part of this notebook. It's in a separate notebook. But because we are using the DLT framework, and once it starts reading the code, it will see, all right, you are referring to some kind of, you know, uh, basically you're referring to a silver table of taxi zones. So it will automatically identify the dependencies and then kind of create the pipeline for us. So before the actual pipeline executes, it's going to scan through all the code, find out what are the dependencies between different tables, and then it is going to create those dependencies. Great. Okay. So Tom is asking in the bronze layer, would you keep all the data you have ever ingested or would you delete it once it was moved into the silver and gold layers? Sure. So ideally we should keep now basically the bronze layer is meant to keep all kinds of raw data. Now this is you know, you know, so you have this can become your single source of truth to have all kinds of data in one single place. Now there are a couple of reasons for this. Number one is that if you have data coming from uh, let's say if you're getting the data from source and source does not keep historical data. For example, if you're getting customer information and once a customer updates the information, you know the previous information is gone. But as a you know as a way house or let's say you know as your uh, as a having a single layer for the raw data, you know as a single layer where you have all the historical information you also need to maintain you know what changes have been done to your data so the raw the bronze layer should ideally be used to have all the historical data so that's why you know we should not delete it but it all depends on your compliance requirements let's say you know if because of gdpr if you have to go and remove a customer information so you of course you have to delete it from the bronze layer as well but i you know in an idle word all the data should always be persisted there but let's say after 10 years if you don't need it or let's say 5 years you don't need it you can go and remove it from the bronze layer okay brilliant so benjamin is asking using the auto loader can you control or monitor what files are loaded? For example, yes. excluding files or reloading certain files. Yes, so auto loader basically, you know, it's based on the streaming concept. Uh, if you look at, for example, Spark structured streaming, Spark structured streaming has got a concept of checkpointing. So the auto loader also works with a checkpointing concept. This means that you know whatever files have been loaded, it keeps a track of it. And next time when you know there is a new file that comes in, it's kind of looking into that, but you know, it will look into that same folder, see that which files have already been loaded and simply ignore them. Uh, so this is that's basically auto loader comes with a checkpointing, you know, functionality that will make sure only the new files are picked up from there. Of course, you know, there are many other tweaks you can do with the auto loader functionality. Like if you want to reload a file, you can do that stuff as well. Okay, so just a couple more questions. So Olaf yep. asks, uh, what does the keyword live do? For example, what's the difference between a delta table and a live yep. delta table? Okay, so basically, if you look, let's say if I create, uh, and if you are already aware about the concept of delta tables, so basically when we say create live table, think of the basically what it's going to do, it's going to create a delta table only. This means this is like a regular delta table. You can go and query it. So let me show this to you as well. 
let's see if my cluster is already running. I can go to this notebook and let's see if it's running. Yep, it's running. So what I can do, this is the table that we created, Drone's live table. And remember we created, how did we create it? We said create live table, uh, yellow taxis underscore Brones live. But what exactly is this? This is actually a Delta table only. Okay, so if you look at this one, it's running, it's just kind of querying it. Hopefully my cluster is running. So this will show you that this is like a regular table. The only difference is that when you say live, of course, can I make some, can I, you know, can I insert some data into this? Yes, I can do it. So I can run queries. If you are aware about Delta tables, you can see I'm running a typical query on a Delta table. This is working fine. Can I do insert into this? Can I update or delete data from here? Yes, I can do that as well. So I can go and run, you know, a typical delete, insert or update queries on Delta tables. The when I put the live keyword, the only difference is that DLT framework knows that this table is being managed by the DLT. If you if you put, you know, let's say if you create a table saying, let's say, let's go back here. Now, if I come here and say create table, this is not going to be managed by DLT. DLT and when you pass this notebook, DLT will throw an exception saying, no, this is not, it's not mentioned as a live table. So, you know, I'm going to throw an exception that, you know, you have something in your notebook, which I'm not going to manage. So if DLT has to work with this, with this particular table or with this particular notebook, the table has to be mentioned as live so that you know that you are creating a Delta table, but this is going to be managed by DLT. That's the difference. So while you, you know, you, sh you know, sh uh, share another question, I'll just put this on the screen so that, you know, people who are aware about Delta tables, they know that, you know, what the history command is showing up. Yeah. Right. So the last one is from Mark who asks, is there a log table or a log file that can be accessed to view the number of failed or successfully loaded rows? Yes, so I I don't have that code right now where I can show that to you, but you can go and so you'll have everything being stored in data lake or basically in your storage in the form of files. You can go and extract, you know, what is right now. I have shown you all the log information inside, let's say through the UI. For example, if we go to this one, so we can see all the some of the information here, like, you know, what what is going on. But if you want to look at, for example, how many tape or you know, like how many records have failed. Uh, let's see if I can show you here. So this information is called expectations and you can actually go and see this information in files. Now you can directly access those files as well, but you have got, you know, the UI, which is picking up from the same files and showing this to you. So ultimately, if you don't need this UI, once your job is done, you have the, you know, you'll have the files available where you have all the information of how many records have failed, but it will only show you a summary if you want to right now find out which all records have failed right now that is in private preview and you should be able to put that in a you know you should be able to put that data into a separate location later on and the last one is do you have any of your code samples available for example on github uh not right now but i can go and share that on a github link but i'm not sure how will i share that right now it's not there uh but yeah, I can kind of make it available if somehow. Uh, okay, what I can do, I can put up a post on my LinkedIn profile if you are, you know, if you can somehow, if you visit, I can, you know, share the link there. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. That's all the questions. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you, everyone. I hope you are able to share your feedback as well. And thank you once again. And I hope to see you next year in person. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>